So what we'll deal with next is James 2. So in this video that we were discussing a moment ago, that justification, is it by work, works or faith alone? And obviously James 2 is, is their classic. And his argument point is that if I believe in faith alone for salvation, I can't then explain James 2 to somebody. I can't use that because James 2 seems to be going against what I said. Whereas he can say John 3.16, somebody who believes in him. Well, actually, he can't say that because if if that's all he gave, he's giving him complete gospel. But Jesus never told Nicodemus to get baptised and this, that and the other. Okay. So, uh, yes, we can actually use James 2, but we need to understand the difference between being justified by uh, faith plus works and being saved by faith plus works because th there is a difference between say salvation and justification okay so just to show you yet another concept he absolutely fails to grasp uh, in this he did this video in, in an interview with this herb shattered guy who i've never heard before but uh, this video came out after i started doing some of the footage for for this refutation so uh this is what they're talking about and about two minutes and 44 seconds in uh, he's explaining how people are misrepresenting his uh, position, I suppose. But people will say to him that it's faith alone that saves. But then he goes on to say, even though James even plainly and unambiguously states that man is not justified by faith alone, yet there's so many that are zealous to this faith alone position. Well, the thing is, the key word there is that it's faith alone that saves. What did, did James say that was saved by faith uh, plus works? That's not what James said. James said that a man is not justified by faith alone. He, did, he didn't say that a man is not saved by faith alone. He said that a man is not justified by faith alone. But you see, he's put those right together there because he just, he does not grasp the difference between those words. Again, he just, he hears the word justified and he automatically thinks in his head the word saved. But that's not true because just like saved can have different contexts in what you're being saved from, like you could be saved for everlasting life or you could just be saved from some sort of earthly disaster or like when jesus saved them from drowning for instance in, in in the waters so just as saved has different contexts well justification can have different contexts as well in terms of what a person is actually justified by or for okay let's let's have a look at the definition of of save in the dictionary so uh it gives a few definitions of here now obviously this first one to deliver from sin that that's obviously a christian spin on the word it's it's not what the word would natively mean if it wasn't for christianity so that's obviously a, a christianese definition of save there but just in the english core language it means to rescue or to deliver from some sort of danger or harm so like saved from drowning for instance or you can say it means to preserve or, or guard from injury or, or destruction or loss so um you know, your your house was flooded, oh, but somebody saved the TV from being drowned, or something like that. Um, you can obviously say that it means to store something. So, like, when you save something on a computer, well, you're preserving it. There's the key word, you're preserving, as, as per the previous definition. So, it can either mean to reserve or preserve or to deliver from some sort of undesirable consequence of some sort. So, obviously, for eternal life, that means save from hell or save from the condemnation, essentially. Now, justified, on the other hand, is a different word, and it, it means to to have or to show a just, right, or reasonable basis for doing something. So a justified punishment is one that's not too harsh, not too lenient. It's the right punishment for the right crime, if you like, or a justified, it says here, justified reputation for toughness. So it's having the right amount of something or the right reason for something. So you can be justified in one sense, and not justified in another sense. So let, let me give you an illustration to explain that. Now, I'm not really an expert in legal matters, especially not in the United States, so do uh, excuse me if I make some mistakes here. But in the US, you have something called the Castle Doctrine, and this is essentially uh, your that it defines your rights to defend your property. And bearing in mind that the United States also has lenient freedoms on gun ownership, uh, that you can possess a firing weapon. Now, in my country, in the United Kingdom, Laws on gun ownership are very restrictive. Um, the common citizen cannot legally own firearms. Now, some exceptions might be given to farmers or if it's something like an air rifle or, or a paintball gun, but, but not a conventional dangerous weapon. 
So we, we do have some freedom to defend our home, but probably not the same extent of leniency as the US has. So even a thief who's trying to steal something, if it's not evident that he's actually trying to cause me any danger, even if I don't necessarily know what his intentions is, I'm probably not justified to just kill him or beat him to death when, the, when there's no obvious threat to my person. Now, the Bible actually gives you the right to defend your home, even to the point of killing a thief who breaks in during the night, and that's in Exodus 22, 2 to 3. And it doesn't even say that the thief has to steal something or threaten you. Just by breaking in, you have that right. So the Bible's actually even more lenient than the laws of the land, okay? Now then, if a thief breaks into the night in my house as a British citizen... I cannot necessarily cause harm to the thief It is if it is not clear that the thief intends on causing harm to me physically. And even then there are limits. I can't just take it to the absolute extreme and just take a knife to his throat when it, it might not be necessary, okay? I'm certainly not legally entitled to own a firearm, especially, especially not as a self-defence weapon, okay? So picture a scenario where I, in Britain, actually use a firearm to defend my home from a thief that has broken in during the night and is attempting to steal my property, but has not explicitly tried to cause me or my family any physical harm. Okay, so under the British legal framework, I'm not legally permitted to own a gun, so I acted with unreasonable force, and I was not justified in defending my home. So if if the threat would be then, if I could be potentially taken to prison, well, I would not be saved from uh, being taken to prison, most likely. I, I would probably go because I was not justified in doing that. Now, I've put the US law in italics because it wouldn't apply to me, but if I was in the United States, well, I might actually be justified to use a gun, depending on how the circumstances played out and, and what the perceived threat was. So, you know, that, that would be for the court to examine. So, with the US, it's a bit more ambiguous. I may be saved from prison. I might not be saved from prison. That would depend on whether it was decided that I was justified. So, if I was justified, I would be saved from prison. If I wasn't justified... I wouldn't be saved from prison. Now, in biblical law, biblical law justifies me in defending my home from an intruder during the night, even to death. So, and, and that's kind of separate from salvation anyway, but I, I still have my eternal salvation. So I'm still eternally saved, regardless of what happens under these laws. So I, as a Christian, I, up, I uphold biblical law. I believe that the law of uh, the Lord is right. So I'm current. I'm currently living in the land of British law, though. I'm not living under the millennial reign of Christ or the, the Old Testament nation of Israel. So I could potentially be in a situation where I'm justified in the sight of God while not being justified in the sight of the law of the land. So you can see that in different contexts, I could be both justified and not justified at the same time. So I could be biblically justified. But in a British court, that's not going to give me a pass because I'm not justified according to British law. So I could still be eternally saved, but not necessarily be saved from prison. OK, or whatever other consequence would, would follow from my lack of justification there. But you can see that in one aspect, I'm justified. In another aspect, I'm not justified. OK, so the, the justification and even the salvation can vary in the context. OK. So in order to deal with James 2, I'll just skim through some points in James 1 really quickly, because that will obviously that's James building up his letter to what, what he goes on to say. So he introduces the letter. It, it, it does say it's to the 12 tribes of which are scattered abroad. So it, it is more of a, a Jewish audience, you might argue. But the fact that it's in our Bible, in our New Testament, means it's just as relevant for Christians as well. And I put that little disclaimer in there because... I know Epiusion has probably been confronted by dispensationalists, and they'll just say that this is a dispensation for the Jews. Of course, what they do is they just invent a dispensation every time something's too difficult for them to explain properly. And guess what? Salvation's always been by faith. It's never been by works, even in the Old Testament. So we don't need to invent a dispensation for this. We can explain it without inventing a dispensation. Okay. So it's introduced to his brethren. So this is not a letter that's like the Gospel of John, where it's intentionally written that you might believe and have everlasting life. It's not written for that purpose. He's written to in encourage his brethren because he's going on to say, count it joy when you fall in, into diverse temptations. So, you know, you're my brethren. You're going to fall into te temptation, but count it a joy. So, so it's an encouragement. James is trying to encourage them. Okay. It's not written to tell them how to be saved. It's written as an encouragement. 
And it, it just further emphasizes that, that knowing this, yes, your faith is going to be tried, but the trying of your faith works patience. So it's building your patience. That's why these things are coming to you. And let patience do its work that you can be perfect and entire and, you know, not lacking anything, not being in need of this or in need of that, because the patience of your faith will, will build what you need. So it's an encouragement. OK, James is encouraging them. And then it goes on to say in verse 12, after he's just discussed about asking in faith for things, uh, that blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. So people like Epiusio, and they're going to take that verse as well. See, you must go through this temptation and endure it, otherwise you won't get the crown of life. But the thing is, though, he's not saying you must do this, that you will, can have the crown of eternal life. It's not using the absolutes. You must have this or do this in order to have this. But again, it, it's an encouragement. Bl blessed is whoever happens to be going through this because the Lord has promised he shall receive a crown of life. OK, so, you know, it's an encouragement that the Lord has already promised this. So keep enduring the temptation. OK, it's not that's not written like an instruction. It's written as ob observation. OK. Then uh, another verse that they want to, to bring up then is uh, in verses 14 and 15. It says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. So this is another one that they want to bring up that if, if you were, if you don't resist the temptation, the sin will work death in you. Okay. Well, again, look at, look at the words that James uses. Look at how he phrases the sentence. He doesn't say in verse 14, if you don't resist temptation, then you will be drawn away by your lust and enticed. He's not even directly addressing you, the people that he's talking to. He's just giving a hypothetical and he says every man, OK, every man is tempted and he's tempted when this happens. Well, they're going to have to endure this temptation. This is going to keep happening. It says he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When he's enticed by his lust, that's when he's tempted. So that that happens every man that's tempted. OK, so this is not... This is not a case of this will only happen if you don't endure the temptation. You're already tempted because this happens, okay? And so then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. Well, we already know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So regarding salvation, that's already been a problem. You've already been tempted, okay? And that's why he's using things like every man and he instead of saying you, the people that I'm talking to, because he could have just worded it like that, if that's what he meant. And if he meant to say that you, my brethren, who I'm talking to, can lose your salvation if you don't do this, well, he ought to have phrased his words a little bit better, better than how he's doing it, because he should have said, if you don't endure temptation, you will be drawn away and enticed, and then sin will bring forth eternal death or eternal damnation. That's what he could have said, if that's what he meant. And this is the thing with Epiusion. They make the apostles sound like crazy people who write convoluted language when you could have just said this so much more directly. You know, he could have just said, you, my brethren, you could be tempted. And if you don't resist, you will go to hell. But he didn't use those words, folks. And that's not how he phrased his words. So be very careful about people who use these somewhat ambiguous and difficult to understand questionable verses that use questionable language to make absolute statements over and against the absolute statements that we do have. OK, and even sin, if it if it could bring forth death in the believer. Well, we've already seen an example of that much earlier in this video. We looked at the example of Saul. He felt died falling on his own sword. Sin brought forth death in that regard. But he didn't change the fact that Samuel said, you shall be with me wherever Samuel was when he died. OK, so again, it, it, the, even words like death can mean different things. So be very careful about people like Epiusion, who use unclear language to make clear doctrines and then just stick the fingers in their ears to, and use this to try and explain all the clear verses and clear language that we actually have in the Bible. OK. And then he goes on to say every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. So the father gives us gifts, perfect gifts. And then in verse 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. So the words, and you could you could say, for example, the words that Christ gave, the words of eternal life, whosoever believeth in me shall not perish. Well, he begat us present tense. OK, so sorry, past tense, excuse me. Past tense, he begat us. So begat, regenerated. So we know that Jesus is the first begotten, the only begotten son of God. And then we are begotten of him. OK, so that's when he regenerated us. And, and how did he regenerate us? Well, it was with the word of truth. It wasn't because we turned from all of our sins to be saved. 
we we should be the first fruits of his creatures because he begat us. Okay. So then he goes on to say, uh, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. And so again, this is another one that Epiusion and people like him will love to jump on because it's it is able to save your souls. And see, he says, lay apart uh, this and do this. Okay. Well, he does say, you know, lay apart your wickedness, leave it aside, reject it. Reject the uh, su superfluity, if you like, or, or the pointlessness of naughtiness because it, it uh, filthiness or wickedness. It serves no real purpose, okay? It might look enticing, but it's superfluous. It doesn't actually do anything good for you, even if it looks enticing. And then receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. So it's still the word that's able to save your souls, okay? Now, we just say it's able to save your souls. Obviously, that might mean then that maybe it won't save some people's souls. But remember that he's dealing with a plural audience, okay? This is not addressed to one person. This is addressed to a multitude. And this is the problem with a lot of their go-to you can lose your salvation verses, is that some of them are addressed to large groups of people. They're not addressed to one person. Well, you can't expect that, like, all the tri all the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad can all lose their salvation in, in one moment, okay? Because salvation is about is individuals. It's not groups of people. So he's writing to a group of people. So, you know, there may be that some people that receive this uh, maybe aren't safe. So they need to receive the engrafted word. OK, so again, it's this encouragement. It's this, you know, keep on doing this. Don't give up this. OK, it, you, you can't really use that as a salvation verse because James is not using clear enough language to understand. You see, when the Gospel of John is written to tell us how to have eternal life, Jesus is using plain language that a child can understand. There is nothing complicated about whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But verses like this really leave more questions than answers if you want to use this as your salvation verses. Okay. And remember that we, we haven't demonstrated that James's letter was even written to tell us how to be saved. Okay. And then, uh, so he goes on to say, but be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And again, another one they love to jump on is that you, you must work your way to heaven. But first of all, it, it's the receiving of, of the, the word with meekness that's actually able to save yourselves. It's not the doing of the word. It's the receiving which saves yourselves. But having received the, the, the words that, that is able to save your souls, don't just be hearers though. Be doers as well. Okay. So it's not, this is what Epiusion just doesn't understand. It's not that works help you get saved, okay? But now that you're saved, well, now that you've received the word, well, now that you've believed on Christ, well, now, now that we've got this, also do this. Do still do the works. Don't just use salvation as free gift as an excuse to not do any work. You've got salvation. You've heard the word with meekness. Now do something about it, okay? Do Be, be a doer as well, okay? Because why? why? Why would you do it? Well, if anybody is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like, so it says he's like, this means it's a simile, okay? This is not a proof text that a man is going to lose his salvation after this. This is a simile. It's like this scenario that he's going to paint. A man beholds his natural face in a glass, so he sees what he looks like, okay? And he should look like somebody like this. He should look like somebody who's laid apart all filthiness and has received the word, the engrafted word, which is able to save his soul. That's what he should look like. This is the appearance that he's supposed to have when he looks in a mirror. So he beholds his natural face in a glass. So that's, if he's done this, that's what he naturally looks like, right? But then if he's not a doer of the word, he looks away, he goes his way, and straight away, sorry, this keeps obstructing the text, straight away forgets what manner of man he was. So it's not that, well, he just loses his salvation because he didn't do the stuff that, you know, was a few verses early. Look, he should look like this. This is what he should look like. He should look like somebody who's received the word and is laying apart all filthiness. But he forgets what he looks like the moment he turns away from the mirror because he's not doing the stuff in the word. He's just hearing it only. OK, so this is the simile that he's using. You should look like a saved person. As saved people, we are not supposed to look like the world. But if you're not doing the stuff in the word, you're immediately forgetting what you look like. You look like somebody who's a Christian, but you're forgetting what you look like when you don't do the stuff that a Christian is supposed to be doing. OK, this has got nothing to do with this is what you must do to be saved. It's got to do with you're not looking like a saved person when this should be your natural face. OK, this is the point that James is trying to get across. But 
whosoever looks at the perfect law of liberty and continues in his liberty therein, perfect law, he, but he's not a forgetful hero, but he does the work, okay, he's a doer of the work, this man shall get his salvation back, shall recover his salvation, oh wait, that's not what he says, he said he shall be blessed in his deed or his work, okay, deed is work, so he shall be blessed in the work that he does. So if you want to be blessed in your work, be a doer of the word, okay? God is not going to be impressed by you running a marathon for charity, okay? He's going to be impressed by you did the... Well, he's not even going to be impressed, really, you know, in a salvation context. Why would God be impressed? But, you know, you shall be blessed in the work you do if you are a doer of the word. Don't expect God to bless you in life if you're constantly disobeying this and disobeying that and you're not laying apart filthiness, okay? Well, look, we've already dealt with this. Much earlier in this video, we dealt with people in the Bible who were believers and still sinned. And we saw what happened to them. And guess what? I don't want to end up like some of the things that happened to David. I don't want to end up like some of the things that happened to Abraham and the things that happened to Samson and Saul. But that's got nothing to do with eternal life, though, folks. It's just I don't want those things to end up on, on me, even in this life. OK, so if I want to be blessed in my work, I better be a doer of the work and I better be a, a doer of the word and not a hearer only. That's the point that James is getting across. OK, that's going to set everything that is going to start telling us in James chapter two. OK, now some people might listen to what I've just explained there about James chapter one. And say that, well, you didn't really explain that very well. I think you're playing word games there. You know, I think maybe you're trying to dance around this kind of stuff. But but the thing is, though, folks, this is this kind of thing is the reason why EPUC on Apologetics has to do videos like how do I know if I've lost my salvation and how do I know if I'm really saved? Because the people that listen to him can listen to as many hours of footage as they want, they're never going to know, really, because their salvation is only ever as good as your opinion of your own works. Well, I think I'm on the right track today, so I must be saved. And then tomorrow, well, I don't think I've done so well today, so maybe I've not saved. And these people constantly need telling how to be saved because they constantly don't know. And the reason why they don't know is because they use books like James 1, which uses difficult language, which is not even clear, and is not even explicitly talking about how to be saved. And they run to that as their go-tos, instead of starting with something simple like John's Gospel, which is actually written to tell us how to be saved. And Jesus used a simple, easy-to-understand language. Okay. Now, yeah, I concede that some of what we've read in James 1 is a little bit difficult to explain when you do believe in faith alone and once saved, always saved. It's probably easier to explain when you don't, when, when you do believe that works are a part of salvation. But here's the thing about that though, folks, is since we have the Gospel of John, which is written specifically for the purpose and it uses clear language, let's start with that first. And then let's re-examine what we actually believe about James 1. Because the thing is with passages like James 1 is, well, when you say sin works death, does that mean eternal death? Or does that mean physical death? James didn't say either way, and he could have just thrown that in there. He could have just said sin works hell or sin works damnation, if that's what he meant. He could have used better words, okay? What does crown of life mean? Does that mean eternal life? Or does that mean that a crown that can be given to some people that have eternal life anyway? Again, it's too open to interpretation. So let's start with what's simple. Let's start with what's clear. Let's start with the Gospel of John and use that. And then let's re-examine what we believe about James 1. Now that we're saved, now that we've believed, then let's get on to some of the more difficult passages in the Bible and, and, and understand it a bit better. Okay, rather than just trying to go with all these convoluted, difficult to explain chapters, and then you have to explain away the Gospel of John. Because Epiusion would say thing, probably say things like, well, well, I can say uh, John 3.16, I can say that whosoever believes in him, you can't say this verse right here in, in James chapter 2. Well, no, actually, you can't say John 3.16, because according to your gospel, Epiusion, Jesus preached a false gospel to Nicodemus, because Jesus never told Nicodemus to uh, do the commandments to be saved. Jesus never told Nicodemus to get baptised and to do this and to start doing that and this, that and the other. That's an isolated conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus only, specifically about eternal life, and Jesus never mentioned those things. So no, you can't say that whosoever believeth in him, because it's not true according to your gospel. That's not enough to be saved, okay? But 
you know, I've tried to the best of my ability to explain explain James one, and explain that this is not clear enough language, and it's just you have to accuse the apostles of writing such complicated, convoluted junk that nobody can understand. But James is written to his brethren. He wrote to his brethren. He wrote to people that, in theory, are already believers. Okay, so let's start with what's simple. Let's start with what's written to tell us how to be saved. And then when we've sorted that out, when we've sorted our eternal life out, then let's go to the difficult chapters. Okay, because eternal life is far too important for us to be wrong about this. So we better be right about this. We better not be using obscure passages to teach the most important thing in the Bible, whether your eternal soul is going to end up in heaven or hell. Now, I can handle somebody not understanding end times and that, you know, Revelation and Daniel are more complicated. Fine, okay? You've got all of your saved life to deal with that. But for eternal life, you better know what you're talking about. And the people that listen to Epiusi don't ask these questions because they don't know if they're going to make it or not. They could just make the wrong choice tomorrow and lose their salvation and die in a car crash for all they know. They don't know. They've got no way of knowing. And so it just goes to show that their, their gospel has absolutely no power to save anybody whatsoever. So with all that rant out of the way, let, let's get on to James chapter 2 and, and finish where we left off. So then, introducing James chapter 2 before we get to the justification by works plus faith... He introduces the chapter saying, have not faith with respect of persons. So this is key to introducing everything that James is talking about in this chapter. Okay, so he gives uh, an example. Uh, I probably should have highlighted this actually, but he gives an example of the church, these people showing special respect to somebody that's got lavish clothing, giving them a special chair and, and saying to the poor, you know, you sit in that rubbish chair over there so it's he's dealing with people that have extra respect for uh, rich or well-dressed or uh, reputable people over the lowly people of the faith okay so this is what he's dealing with and then he goes on to explain uh, has not god chosen the poor who are rich in faith to be heirs of the kingdom you know he's it, getting a put across the point that people who were poor as long as they're believers they're just as respectable if not more respectable actually in the kingdom of heaven okay they're, they're just as equal they're just as important god is not a respecter of persons he doesn't have special respect for people of high reputation and rich people usually actually god has less respect for those people and so he's saying you uh, and again this is plural because it's, it's ye it's not the or thou it's plural but you collectively and, and really specifically the people that have done this the people that have shown special respect to rich or important people you have despised the poor okay is it not the rich people that oppress you and, and draw draw you before the judgment seat so you're paying special respect to these rich people when they're the ones that oppress you and to give an example of this, um, a few years back, at a church that I was attending at the time, uh, they had the mayor come in to uh, give some kind of a speech in place of a, a Sunday sermon. So we didn't have a sermon, instead it was having the mayor come in and, and preach. This mayor wasn't even a Christian, he was a Muslim in fact. And so everyone's all excited, like, yeah, we're going to have the mayor come in our church and it's going to be such an honour. Oh, the mayor, the mayor, and everybody's fussing about the, the chuffing mayor. I didn't turn up to the service on that day, I'll have you know, because I don't have special respect for the mayor. And actually, is it not people in government seats, especially in my country and in Europe, countries people in government or the people legislating against christianity now the mary my city doesn't really probably have a lot of political power really but he's not a bible believing christian and the council in the, in the city where i live is not remarkably pro-christian okay they endorse a lot of things which are against christianity so this church is showing all this special respect to people of political importance when it's politicians that are legislating against christianity in this country and yet you show them special respect respect and it's it's disgusting to be honest and so that's the kind of thing that james is dealing with in this chapter it's people that are just respecting the people who they shouldn't be respecting and they're disregarding and despising the people that are actually very rich in faith and in the kingdom of God are far more important than, you know, the people that they want to respect. So that that's the point that James is getting across here. OK, so moving further and further into the chapter, then uh, verse eight, James says, if you fulfill the royal law, according to scripture. Now, it's quite an unusual term, royal law. What does he mean by that? Well, the thing is, he, he goes on to quote in that same verse, Old Testament law. So that's the royal law. OK, that you shall love your neighbour as yourself. You you do well. So you, you do well if you fulfil the royal law. Now, remember that um, he was trying to pit the works of the law 
against the, the Mosaic law, against the New Testament works of Christ, that we have to follow the New Testament law, we don't follow the Mosaic law. But once again, James is quoting Old Testament law before he then goes on to tell us how we're justified by works as well as faith. So it just goes to show, once again, how he just completely debunks himself. Uh, because this is not talking about works of faith or works of Christ. He introduces this with the the royal law, the Old Testament Mosaic law. So you do well if you love your neighbour as yourself. Well, that's an Old Testament law. Bearing in mind that Epiusio News, Luke 10, which uh, quotes the same verse, uh, because Jesus said, well, you've answered correctly. You must do these things to live. You know, that's how he was interpreting that verse, which is just completely bizarre with what we're reading in James. So... Uh, it goes on to say, if you have respect of p- persons, you commit sin. Y- you are breaking this law that you shall love your neighbour as yourself, if you have special respect of persons. And then key point, whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet in one point, it offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Okay, so you only have to offend one point of the law, and you've broken the whole law. Okay, so you can start to see why we're not justified by works of the law. And... Uh, parallel passages what Paul talks about in Galatians that Epiusion himself already referred to in in some of his videos Galatians 3:10 for as many as are the works of the law are under a curse under the curse for it is written cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them so uh Later in Galatians 5, 3, he says, For I testify against every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So Epiusion was trying to create this false framework where, well, we don't obey the law to be circumcised, but we do need to obey the laws about uh, loving your neighbour and, and loving God. Well, if that's the case, you have to obey the law to be circumcised then, because you have to obey the whole law. And if you've even broken one point in the law, you've broken all of them. So if he's not circumcised, well, he's, he's broken the, the law then. So again, he's trying to create a false dichotomy that doesn't exist. Uh, And so James further emphasised this. uh, He who said do not commit adultery said also do not kill. Now, if you commit no adultery, yet if you kill, you are a transgressor of the law. So again, it only takes one single sin and you've broken the whole law. That that's all it takes. So you can't ask stupid questions like, how many sins does it take for me to lose salvation? If you've broken one sin, you've broken the whole law. Okay. That's that's how it's that's how it's worded. And so then James goes on to say, So speak you, and do so, as they that shall be judged by. Well, how will they be judged? By the, by the law? Well, not by the Mosaic law, not by the royal law, by the law of liberty. And again, Paul talks about uh, our freedom in Christ, our liberty in Christ. We're, we're, we're at liberty, we're free, because we're free from the judgment of the law. See, the law, the, the Old Testament law is that sin brings death and by extension of that eternal death as well so we are set free from that law therefore we will be judged by the law of liberty and so then if we're under the law of liberty well how do we speak and do as those who shall be judged by the law of liberty well we don't have respect of persons okay and if you have respect of persons you're breaking the royal law so what he's saying is here well you will be judged by the law of liberty but guess what love thy neighbor as thyself okay don't have respect of persons so what the gist of it here is yes you should be doing the the works of the law essentially you should be loving god loving your neighbor as yourself but understand that if you've broken one you've broken them all so you're not going to get to heaven by following the law okay but nevertheless having the law of liberty still obey these precepts okay obey them but not for salvation and we already saw that earlier if you love me keep my commandments but it's not if you want to be saved keep my commandments separate those two things so he then says uh, for he shall have judgment without mercy that has shown no mercy and mercy rejoices against judgment so god will judge those who have respect of persons but if they are saved then they are judged by the law of liberty no less okay so that's why Paul says things like, if any man's work be burnt up, he himself shall be saved, but he shall suffer loss. He, he, uh, he, you know, he shall have loss of reward. And Jesus says there are those who are great in the kingdom of heaven, and there are those who are least in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, because that's how those under the law of liberty shall be judged. But sin itself cannot take hold of them. They cannot be condemned under the royal law. Whereas for the unsaved world, that's not the case. So I'm just moving across to the tablet for this, so it's a bit easier for me to circle things and point certain things out. So now that we've disproven his uh, false dichotomy between works of the law versus works of Christ, we can now put James 2 and we'll also put Romans 4 together, okay? Because these, these are good parallel passages to have side by side, 
All right, and it, re it will really explain this point. So let's just zoom into James and continue where we left off. So all the stuff that he's going to say about being justified by works, this is how he's introducing it. Verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and has not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked, destitute of food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful for the body. And again, he asks that same question, what does it profit? So between what does it profit in verse 14 and verse 16, we can kind of see these as bookends, if you like. And what this is defining for us is the context. So this is what James means by the righteousness, uh, sorry, not the righteousness, sorry, the, the justification by the the works okay so notice he's not saying what does it profit my brethren if a man wants to enter into heaven and hath not work to show for the kingdom can he enter therein that's not how james introduces this he's introducing profiting of the brethren okay that's what he's talking about so that's the justification that he's going to talk about now he asks this hypothetical question though a man say he has faith and has not works and then he asks the crucial question here, can faith save him? Okay, now bear in mind, James asks a closed question, but he doesn't give a closed answer. He doesn't give a yes or no answer to a yes or no question. He goes on to give an open answer, and that means there's some degree for interpretation. Now, can faith save him? Question mark. Well, obviously, the substance of what James is saying would cast doubt on this that well no he probably isn't saved if he doesn't have these works but we only have an open answer to a closed question we don't specifically have a yes or a no so it's a, it's a hypothetical question that doesn't have an absolutely explicit answer we just have uh, an explanation that w would at least cast doubt on the faith of a man who has no works even though he says he's saved the next thing to point out is that james said though a man say he has faith and have not works. So this doesn't, ex the, the hypothetical man being explained here, it doesn't absolutely say that this man had faith. It just says that he says he has faith. So he claims to have faith, but he just seems to have no works to show for it. And, and works in the context of what? Well, again, profiting, my brethren. What does it profit? What are you profiting, uh, my brothers or sisters, um, if, you know, if you don't help their, their needs, as he goes on to explain in verses 15 and 16. So then if you wonder why he doesn't have the works, well, the problem stems from his faith. The problem is not with his lack of works in and of themselves. It's that those lack of works stem from his faith. His faith is doubtful here because he says he has faith. But how can we look at him and know that he has faith? We can't. OK, the next thing to point out is that when he asks, can faith save him? Well, he only says he has faith, he doesn't say that he has faith. So can faith save him if he only says he has faith and doesn't actually have faith? But save him from what? Because if you look at the verses that we saw earlier in James, just before 14, well, James does speak about judgment without mercy. Now, again, people want to make that about judgment uh, in hell and that kind of thing. But James hasn't really mentioned condemnation. He hasn't mentioned hell. We don't want to put words in James's mouth that he didn't actually say. Uh, so this is too open to interpretation. And he's already pointed out that the people he's speaking to will be judged by the law of liberty as opposed to the, the royal law. Okay. So that, that they're under the judgment as according to the law of liberty, not as according to the, to the Mosaic law. More of a question of can faith, faith save him on this particular issue? Not necessarily hellfire because we haven't got enough background context here to say that hell or damnation is the specific issue being addressed. It's just James hasn't mentioned it. So you have to make James say that when James could have just said that if that's what he really meant. Now, let's just say that it does mean eternal salvation. Well, it still only says that he says he has faith, not that he actually has faith. And James says, can faith save him? And he asks a question. That's a question. It's not a statement. It's a question. OK, now then he'll go on to verse 17 to explain that even so faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Now, they want people like Epiusium will take that statement and they'll say, well, see, your faith doesn't work. You have no faith if you don't have works. But the thing is, it doesn't say that faith without works 
doesn't exist. It says that it's dead. Okay. Now, uh, when something's dead, that means it was once alive. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Again, if you're just going to say, well, if you don't have works, you don't have faith, or you have faith, well, then you're making James look like a crazy person who uses weird words and can't string a sentence together. It says that the faith is dead. It doesn't say that the faith doesn't exist. So for faith without works to be dead, it still has to exist by definition. Okay. If you want to ask the question, is if, if faith is dead, can it really save and obviously because we've got this kind of a question here it, it does look skeptical at best but once again it still only says say i'm just going to keep pointing that out until people get it and we've still got our context what does it profit my brethren what does it profit if this in verse 15 and 16 so that's still the context of a dead faith there is no mention of whether eternal salvation is is affected by this it's only what it profits a brother or a sister that's naked or destitute that's the only context that we've got to go on here for this dead faith that, that's that's alone okay now then verse 18 yea a man may say so again this is only say so this doesn't prove the heart of a man explicitly by the narrator it's only if a man says well well then we can only go on what a man says to us we can't know for sure right otherwise it's it's pointless to to say this james could have just said yea though a man uh has faith and has not works he could have worded it like that but no it's all about saying so again it's profiting what does it profit the brethren and though a man say so this is only how brethren can identify each other that again that's the best that we've got to go on from what james actually offers us in the text okay so he asks this hypothetical question a man may say you have faith and i have works uh, show me your faith without your works and i will show uh, my faith by my works okay so that's that's verse 18 now, what's interesting about this in verse 18 is that James has flipped a hypothetical man here because in verse 14, the hypothetical man had faith and not works. Yet in verse 18, the hypothetical man, it's the other way around. He says, well, you have faith, but I have works. So this hypothetical man in verse 18 is completely flipped from the hypothetical man described in verse 14, right? And this man says to this other man, well, you have your faith and I have works. OK, so you show me your faith without your works and I will show you uh, my faith by my works. So this is not evident that this is an eternal life exchange between man and God or man and Jesus or anything like that. This is, would be like you and me sat, sat with each other. You, you, me talking to you, you talking to me. So you might say to me, well, well, you have faith and I have works. And then, you know, show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works, excuse me. So the point here is that in this man-to-man -man relationship, one man is saying to the other man, look, look at my works to show for my faith. So this is a, this is a brethren encouragement. This is between brethren and what's James addressing. What does it profit my brethren? So this is all about the brethren. This is not about your eternal life or your salvation. It's profiting the brethren and it's, well, you, okay, you have your faith without your works, but look, I have the faith with works. So brethren encouraging one another to have faith with works. Okay. We should be striving to, to encourage one another to get works. And of course, that, that is the duty of the brethren, to encourage one another, to edify one another, to promote each other to good works. There are other passages in the Bible that talk about stuff like that. Okay, so it's perfectly consistent with what James is saying. Now then, verse 19, you believe that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. And a lot of unsaved people use this as a proof text that it's not enough to believe for salvation because the devils also believe and of course devils are not saved well the problem is with using this verse to to say that is that this is actually somewhat of a, of a red herring because first of all what does it say it says you believe there is one god so it doesn't say you believe on the lord jesus christ that thou shalt be saved it just says that you believe in one god well guess what there's a billion muslims who believe that there is one god there's a bunch of catholics who believe that there's one god that that in itself is not what saves a person because they have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is, again, this is all we've got to go on is that they, that you believe there's one God. That's all we've got to go on. Okay. That's not in itself evidence of salvation. 
Now, it says you believe there is one God, and guess what? You actually do well. So you do well for believing that. There is only one God. So if you believe that, you are doing well by believing that. However, having said that, the devils also believe and tremble. Now, what, what does tremble mean? You might say it means to fear. So you could say that the person that James is addressing... And, and again, this is not James addressing the people that he's talking to directly because he's not using ye or you. It's thou which is singular, and that's this man here that's saying that. So a man may say thou, and so it's this man that's saying to the other man, you believe there is one God, and you do well to believe that. The devils out there also believe and tremble, okay, in fear. So this man is getting across to the other man. Look, you have faith. I have faith. I have works. So you you show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. And you believe there is one God. Well, the devils also believe that and tremble. So it's it's kind of like a man is rebuking another man, saying, "Hey, you're you're showing a lack of fear for God here. You need to start doing some works. You know, you need to have these works." Okay. So it's got nothing to do with being saved. This is a man to man exchange where one man is exhorting, is sorry, encouraging another man to have works and and have this fear for God. And the thing is, when it says devils also believe, and we know that uh, devils uh, are obviously not saved, this is this is still a, a red herring. It's a straw man because Jesus didn't come to die for devils. Okay, Jesus came to die for man. Now, man was born in sin. Man needs to get saved and pass on to life. The angels, there are the angels that kept their first estate and there are the angels that departed from their first estate. And that's described in like Second Peter uh, and Jude, for example. So with the angels, the angels don't get saved in the way that you and I get saved. They're not born in sin and then they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that they shall not be saved. That's not how salvation works for angels. OK, with angels, it's just there are those who kept the first estate and there are those that left the first estate. And that's all there is. And th there is no reversing from that. That's that's the difference between man and angel. So that that is a red herring. It's got nothing to do with whether faith alone can save. OK, James says, but will thou know? So again, it's this thou. This is the, the man here that's speaking to the other man. This is not James, the narrator, writing to the brethren directly. He's giving an analogy between two men here. And one man is saying to the other, O oh, vain man, uh, that faith without works is dead. Well, why is it dead? Because what does it profit, my brethren? What does it profit? It's not profiting the brethren. What if our sister or our brother is naked, destitute and daily food? And you just say, well, depart and be warm, but you don't do anything to give things which are needful. Like, your faith is not profiting the brethren. Your faith. And so that's the context of your faith is dead. And you can say, well, salvation. There's no evidence that this is salvation related. You haven't got enough to go on. When it comes to profiting the brethren, that's the context that James gives us. So if you have a problem with it, you need to take it up with James because that's what he said. OK, he could have talked about righteousness and eternal life here. He didn't talk about it. So you can't just put words in his mouth to prop up your wicked false doctrine. All right. And then so he goes on to give the example of Abraham. So was not our father Abraham justified by work? So there it is. There's that word justified. When he offered Isaac his son upon the altar, seeing you how seeing thou how that faith wrought his works and by works his faith was made perfect. Now, sometimes often when we think of perfect, we mean absolutely without any fault. But perfect can also mean uh, complete as well. Okay, so. Uh, you know, somewhat open to interpretation between those. But the scripture was fulfilled. Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Uh, and he was called a friend of God. So that's the scripture that was fulfilled by Abraham uh, doing these things. And so you see then that how by works uh, a man is justified and that not by faith only. So uh, Abraham kind of gives, gives us a key here to, to sort of understanding exactly the point that James is making here. So this would be a good time to bring in Romans 4 as a cross-reference, because uh, Romans 4, Paul talks about Abraham's justification, and uh, this same uh, scripture is quoted as well. So let's uh, compare the two together. So uh, I apologise if uh, this won't be very clear for people to read, but on the left we have Romans 4. So Paul introduces this saying, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. 
For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that works not is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not and but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted uh, for righteousness. So uh, I'll start with the first five verses, but perhaps come back to those other ones later. So then, starting at verse two, Paul gives us an if. If Abraham were justified by works. Well, either Abraham's justified by works or he's not justified by works. It's really yes or no. So if it's true, so if the answer is yes, well, um, according to James, that is, that is the case. According to verse 21 in James 2, Abraham is justified by works. So we see the connection there. Okay. Well, according to James, it is. So, yes, Paul, you say if Abraham were justified, but yes, he is, according to James. So carry on, Paul. What, what, what's your point? Well, he has whereof to glory. So Abraham has glory in his works. But, and this is the key bit, not before God. So Abraham can't go to God and say, well, look at my works, uh, God, I've, I've, you know, I'm justified because of my works. Look at my works. He can't glory in his works before God. So, if he can't glory in his works before God, if he's not, what, who is it? Who is he glorying in front of? Well, me personally, I think the only option left is man. Okay, so you could argue he has glory before man, and as men, we would all agree that we we think Abraham was. Uh, a righteous man we think that abraham did showed his faith he did a lot of good stuff we would say yeah he is justified in terms of how he lived his life for the most part well what's the entire premise of what james has been talking about well it's what does my what does it profit my brethren what does it profit so it's all about profiting my brethren a brother or a sister that's naked yea a man may say so one man is saying to another okay in this exchange so we see men talking to each other in James, we see what does it profit my brethren? Well, we see Abraham has glory before man, before his brethren, before his sister or brother, but not before God. So what this will lead on to, and you might think, well, I don't quite agree with what you're saying here. Well, we'll we'll get on more to this about what the difference is between the, the justification in Romans 4 that's without works and the justification in James 2 that's with works. Okay. Now then, in verse 3, Paul quotes the Old Testament from Genesis, and he says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Okay? Now, uh, James also says that Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto righteousness. So both James and Paul quote the same scriptures. You can see how these, these passages are really good parallels to put side by side next to each other. Okay? Now, in James's case, James goes on to quote another scripture from Isaiah that he was called a friend of God. Well, Paul doesn't quote that scripture, only James quotes that, okay? So that, that's also being fulfilled in what James is talking about. Now then, in both of these cases, because they are obviously quoting from the scripture, we see Abraham believed God, so that was his faith, okay? And what, what was that counted towards? What did his faith or his belief in God count towards okay so we can ask that question in romans we can ask that question in james because it's the same scripture being quoted well it was counted unto him for righteousness okay and again so that's that's what james obviously quoting the same thing his belief uh, his faith in god counted unto him for righteousness and there's the key word there for the justification being spoken of all right now then in romans 4 5 paul goes on to say but to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies. Well, who does he justify? He justifies the ungodly. He doesn't justify those who have turned from all of their sins to be saved. He justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. And again, what did the quote from the Old Testament? They both quoted that it's Abraham's belief in God that counted for him for righteousness. Okay, so then. Romans 4 is going to go on to explain this in a bit more detail. So even David, so it's not just Abraham, okay, even David. And the point here is that Old Testament believers were not saved by doing the works of the law. They were saved by faith in the Old Testament, were saved by faith in the New Testament, okay? So Abraham also described the blessedness of the man unto whom will God, God will impute righteousness without works. So righteousness there is without works. Now, according to James were justified by faith plus works. But according to Romans, righteousness is without works. So hold that thought because that 
is going to be mega important. Sorry, I know my scribbling is getting everywhere, but that is going to be mega important. OK, and so uh, further emphasizing what David already said, uh, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Now, when it says are covered, that ties in with what we read more towards the beginning of this refutation when we looked at Hebrews 10 and our Epusion just completely misquotes Hebrews 10. So, yes, there is ongoing forgiveness, as we see from other passages like the Lord's Prayer and so on and so forth. But sins are covered as far as as far as Christ's blood is concerned. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. Why? Because blessed are, is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So he has righteousness, which by the way is without works, and the sins are covered and the Lord will not impute sin. So it's not he does not impute the sins up until now, it's he will not impute sin, future tense. Okay? So then, he then goes on to explain in 9 to 10 that blessedness is not just on those who are circumcised, it's on those who are uncircumcised. Why? Because once again, repeating what Paul has already said perfectly clearly, just in case you missed it the first time, faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So you see how his righteousness ties in with his faith without works. His works are not involved for this righteousness. Um, and then uh, it goes, how is it reckoned when he was in circumcision or uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So his righteousness was apart from his circumcision, had nothing to do with him being circumcised. And it goes on to explain circumcision was just the, the sealing of the, the covenant. It's like signing a contract, if you will. But that wasn't the actual reasoning for his righteousness. OK, now then. Do we have a contradiction here? Because in Romans 4, 5, it's to him that works not but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So according to Romans 4, 5, him that works not but believes can still have righteousness. Okay? Now, James 4 asks this question, though a man says he has faith, and again, he only said he has faith, doesn't mean he has faith, and have not works, can faith save him? Well, are these statements in opposition to each other? Do they contradict each other? Well, James is asking a question, okay? It's a yes or no question, and although what James goes on to say does seem like he's saying a no, he doesn't just say no, even though he asked the yes or no question. And he is, again, emphasising the fact that he's asking a question. Paul is making a statement. So if we're going to go between, well, is it James 2.14 or is it Romans 4.5? If a man has faith and not have works, can faith save him? Well, according to Romans 4, 5, he will be justified for righteousness. So the answer is yes. Okay. And again, James is only saying a man says he has faith. That doesn't mean he actually has faith. And again, what is James talking about? The profiting of the brethren. Okay. So then, if righteousness is by faith without works, what is James talking about? Right. Well, Paul has mentioned righteousness multiple times in these few verses. James only mentions it once, and when he's mentioning it, it's in his quote that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's when James quotes the righteousness. OK, but what Paul doesn't do that James does do is that Paul, James also goes on to say he was called the friend of God. Now, Paul didn't point that one out. And the verse that James quoted for Abraham's righteousness only mentions his belief. It, it doesn't mention his works. OK. And then so the justification in Romans 4 that Paul's talking about how we're justified by faith without works is for righteousness. When James is pointing out righteous, uh, sorry, when he's pointing out justification by faith plus works, it's not specifically for righteousness. It's for profiting a brother or sister. And as I said earlier in the chapter, it's not having faith with special respect of different persons, like having respect for the rich men over the poor men. So it's it's how it profits your brethren. And again, a man may say, so it's one man talking to another. This is a man to man, brethren to brethren relationship where there is justification by works as well. So then, when James is quoting Abraham's faith and works, and it's that it's made perfect here in verse 22, okay, we then see in verse 23, two parts to this, his belief for righteousness, and while we're at it, he was called a friend of God, okay? You see how faith wrought his works, and by works was faith made perfect. So his faith, well, that fulfills the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. 
then his works is fulfilling the scripture he was called a friend of God that's what's being fulfilled by his works and it's for the profit of the brethren okay now you might ask the question am I inventing a connection between his works and being called a friend specifically where there's no connection between that exclusively well the, the thing is when when he's quoting the scripture here, Abraham was called a friend of God it's from Isaiah 41 uh, verse 8 and that chapter if you go back and read it it doesn't actually specifically explain why Abraham is called a friend of God so we don't know quite exactly how James would have known that from Isaiah 41 itself but we could have a clue as to why James would know that and make a connection between those two and I think the best place to go to to explain this would be from John's gospel so in John chapter 15, Jesus is having a private, intimate conversation with his own disciples. So his disciples, again, already believers. They don't need to be told how to be saved. They're already his believers, just as James was dealing with my brethren, okay, his brothers and his sisters. So J Jesus is talking to his closest disciples, and he goes on to say, um, in verse 13, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay his life for his friends, lays down his life, you are my friends, and there's a condition here. If you do whatsoever I command you. So by your works, by obeying Jesus' commandments, you are his friends. So this doesn't say you are saved if you do this. It doesn't say you will have eternal life if you do this. But you are his friends if you do what he commands you. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. So from this point forward... Jesus is not calling them his servants only. He's now calling them his friends. This is his closest disciples. They've stuck with him all the way up until this point. They've been following him around. They've been listening to his teachings. He sent them out to do this, that and the other. He's now calling them his friends. So he's elevating their status from being mere servants. And then he goes on to say to them, these, these things I command you, that you, as my friends, love one another. So you, you're Jesus' friends, and you need to, I want you to love one another as well. Don't just love me, but love one another. And again, James talking about profiting a brother, a sister, okay. So you see how this all ties in with your works, your obeying Jesus' commandments is what makes you a friend. It's me, being his friend. And so Abraham's faith for his righteousness, his works, for his friendship okay so then why is romans 4 5 faith without works because it's believing for righteousness that's the justification of faith without works and likewise james also for righteousness quotes a verse that only deals with abraham's faith but for friendship or fellowship that's works that's where the justification of works comes in okay so then what what why is that justification by faith plus works and that's justification by faith without works well it's because of the context of being justified by so in romans 4 we're dealing with justification for righteousness before god in james chapter 2 we're dealing with justification for friendship with god and before the brethren that's the difference between those justifications so you cannot use james to prove that you need works to be saved because you might as well just say that the gospel uh, sorry that the, the bible contradicts itself if you're going to say that now, back in his Faith Alone interview with this guy, he uh, they were trying to refute this difference between justification before God in Romans 4 and justification before man in James chapter 2, because he, he's heard that before. I, I'm, you know, I'm not introducing this as some new concept that he's not heard of. So in the transcript, that's what he points out about 12 minutes in, that, uh, you know, he hears this all the time, that uh, Abraham was justified in front of other people, but he wasn't justified before God. And then how he refutes that is by saying that when Abraham was sacrificing his son, there wasn't anybody else there. So then how is he justifying himself before other people if, if nobody else was present? That, that's the argument that he's making. Again, this is just where people put their own carnal logic over and above what the Bible actually says. Because Romans flat out tells you that Abraham couldn't glory before God. So there's really only man left anyway. And whether or not other people were present there, we don't really know about that. And, and the fact of the matter is, whether anybody else was present or not, we know about that story. That story is in the Bible for all eternity. That's eternally part of God's word. And Genesis wasn't even written by Abraham. It was written long after Abraham. So one way or another, we know about that story. And that story in the Bible has been used to influence 
millions of believers for for hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of years okay and so was was not abraham our father well abraham is the father of all that believe as romans also explains when paul explains that so we can look at abraham and we can look at his life and say yeah that was a faithful man he looked like somebody that was faithful now to play devil's advocate although i've uh attempted to defend one saved always saved let's pick a character in the bible that's sometimes one of the token uh sort of poster children for characters who lost their salvation well usually people think of judas but i've already argued that judas was already false um but let, let's think of saul okay because saul is another character that's often used as, as a suggestion for somebody who lost their salvation right well we already saw scripture that refutes that because samuel said you would be with me but but why would they pick saul well, they picked Saul because if we're justifying his faith by his works, Saul lived the life of what looks like a very unfaithful person. And so he's like that person that James talks about in chapter one, where he sees himself in the mirror, but then looks away and immediately forgets what he looks like. He forgets that he looks like the king of God's chosen nation because he is just acting and behaving like all of the pagans out there consulting a witch. OK, so there's a perfect example is that we we look at Saul and we think he was unfaithful because of how he lived his life. We look at Abraham and think he is faithful. He lived his life faithfully. Saul didn't. But Abraham wasn't perfect, though. Abraham made mistakes. Abraham told porcupines. Abraham had mo mo more than one wife. Abraham had concubines. So this idea that bad people only do bad stuff and good people only do good stuff is not biblical and it's really that's about as much character depth as you'd see in a cartoon or you know a kid's book so you know it just shows that these people have about as much understanding as a, as a children's book really it, it you know pe there were bad people in the bible who did good stuff and there were good people in the bible who did bad stuff as well okay just to get a balancing view and just as the sort of let's, let's put some icing on the cake for james chapter two so in verse 25 james is going to end this chapter saying likewise was not rahab the harlot justified by works now was she justified by works from turning and being a harlot and turning from all of her sins because she was such a harlot that's not what james says james still calls her a harlot he could have just called her rahab and we'd still figure out who he was talking about but he still calls her a harlot and then explains how she was justified by works it wasn't from turning all of her sins and believing all of the commandments it was just that she received the messages and sent them another way and if you read the story of rahab in joshua chapter 2 it doesn't mention her faith it doesn't mention her belief it doesn't mention whether we whether she went to heaven or hell so what's james's point here well we would judge rahab as a good person Obviously, she was still a harlot, but why do we judge her as someone who probably made it to heaven? Well, because her works make it look like she did seem to receive the message that was given to her. She acknowledged that the Israelites were on the good side, essentially, by, by doing these things. And so that's how Rahab was justified. Her story proves that she was probably a faithful person because she did this for the Israelites. So we would look at Rahab as a good character, despite the fact that she's still rahab the harlot and she's going to be remembered as rahab the harlot forever because that's how the bible records that's what we also know about her and there's there's no mention of a turning from being a harlot in this bit that james is talking about and if we have to turn from our sins as epiusio thinks you'd think that would be a pretty important detail for james to mention and so here we, we see then this context that the body without the spirit is dead and so faith without works is dead also well the body the body was once alive it wasn't forever dead it doesn't not exist it, it was once alive but it just becomes dead when the spirit departs from it but believers also have a future resurrection so the body is coming back and it will be a new body okay so yes faith without works is dead also it was once alive but it's not benefiting the brethren and so now it's died but that that doesn't change salvation where the person will be resurrected anyway okay and they will be faithful in their resurrected body and so you can say that, well, I don't like that. I still think it's talking about salvation. Well, well, the problem is, folks, you know, we, we've got the context that James gives us. It's brethren to brethren related. It's man to man related. This is all we've got to go on. OK, we haven't got eternal life to go on here. We haven't got righteousness to go on here. We haven't got your right standing with God to talk about this justification. It's not there. This is what we've got.
So yes, James 2 is justification before the brethren. Romans 4 is justification before God for righteousness. So that's why salvation is by grace through faith without works. But if I look at you and I think you look like the world, you sound like the world, you talk like the world, you have the same opinions of the world. Well, my natural in inclination is to think that you're not saved because you look like the world. But if you are of the world, it's because of what you believe. It's not because of what you do. And, and that's the thing. When people have these rotten works... It's because of what they believe. It's not because of, it's not the works themselves. The works are just reflecting what they already believe. Okay. And so here's the thing, folks, is that, you know, these people with wicked works, like Ravi Zacharias, why did he have the rotten fruit of sexual perversion? Well, it was because he was a false believer. Who cares if he did so much work in Christian apologetics? God is not a respecter of persons. He was never saved. Why did Joseph Smith write his own Bible and make up his, new, his own New Testament? Because he was a false prophet with wicked beliefs and he was never saved. Why does Kenneth Copeland preach false doctrine and milk his flock for billions of dollars? Because he is a false prophet. He has always been false and he was never saved. He wasn't right one time in his life. These people were never justified by faith for righteousness. They're certainly not justified by works before the brethren. And so wrapping this all up then, that let, let's just look at justification by faith without works and faith with works. So justified by faith without works, well before God... You are justified, as in you have good reason for righteousness, by faith, because your works do not justify your righteousness. Why? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's that's Paul's entire premise uh, in, the, in the first half of Romans. And so we see why as well when he wrote to the Ephesians, he said that salvation is by grace through faith and not of works, because for salvation we require righteousness. Well, it's Christ's right, righteousness imputed unto us, therefore it's by faith not of works you cannot be justified for righteousness with works you cannot be saved uh, with works okay works must be apart from salvation consider the fact that if, if it helps god god knows everything okay so god already knows whether you actually have faith or not you, you can't prove anything to god so you can't say well you're not proving your faith to god because your faith is not producing works. god already knows whether i truly believe or not he already knows wh whether somebody has the faith he doesn't need anything to be proved okay Whereas justification by faith with works, well, that's before the brethren, because that's what James was dealing with. Your brethren, what does it profit your brethren if a brother or a sister is naked? Don't show respect of persons uh, with your faith to the brethren. So before the brethren, you are justified, as in you have good reason for showing your genuine faith, because your faith profits the brethren being alive. OK, and why? Well, consider the fact that man cannot see your faith he can only justify you by your works i've probably not phrased that right rather you can only justify yourself before man with your works but you see someone can tell me well i am a bible believing christian you know I, I believe god all that kind of thing but then me not knowing absolute with absolute certainty whether they really believe or not well you know if, if we as christians if we see a man who looks like the world sounds like the world has the same opinions of the world well, obviously, we, we're generally going to conclude that he is of the world, okay? That, that, because that's what he looks like. So that's all we can, that's all we've got to go on. But the problem with his salvation does not stem from his works, though, okay? His works are really only the symptom. The root cause is that it's his faulty belief. The faith is the problem. And if someone has no works or evil works, all that is, it's just, it's just a reflection of their faith, okay? But it's, it's still the faith itself that, that ultimately determines wh whether they are saved or not. And so, Regardless of whether we think a Christian's faith is justified by his works or not, ultimately, he either is or not justified before God for righteousness onto eternal life based on what he believes, not on what he does. So if, you know, like the Bible says, if any man's work be burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. That's in 1 Corinthians. But in that same book, Paul deals with throwing people out of a church who calls himself a brother, yet he's doing some of these wicked sins because he's supposed to be one of us. But he's acting like one of them. That okay? That's that's why Paul says, it, "Throw out from among yourselves that wicked person. Give him over to Satan, for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved." That's why also Paul says in Romans, "To him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness." Well, we can say that if if salvation doesn't require any works, you can't say that if salvation requires works to justify it. And so, um, that's really all I'm going to say about James two now. Um. But it, late in this interview, they also talk about Martin Luther and how he couldn't answer James too. So uh, he wants to take it out of the Bible and then people resisted, uh, all that kind of thing. Uh, you've got the dispensationalist view where they just say it just applies to the Jews only. But the thing is, though, folks, 
We've answered James too now, and we've never had to refer to Martin Luther. We've never had to refer to John Calvin. We've never once had to refer to what some random theologian in history said. Okay, we haven't had to make up a fictional dispensation that doesn't exist to just say it applies to the Jews only. We've answered it from the Bible. The Bible stands up for itself. And so they can straw man and say that, you know, I'm just following a doctrine that some man invented in the 1500s. Well, I reject Martin Luther and I reject John Calvin anyway. So what they believe doesn't really concern me. We just went to the Bible and we just let the Bible answer for itself. Okay, you know, need I say any more? So that's James chapter two wrapped up. Uh, I'm going to pick on something else next to uh, to deal with.